Massachusetts. It's theCUBE, covering HPE Big Data Conference 2016. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. Welcome back to Boston, everybody. This is theCUBE, we're here live at HP's Big Data Conference. Hashtag seize the data. Steve Spear is here. He's an author, MIT professor, uh, author of The High Velocity Edge. Welcome to theCUBE, thanks for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. I, I got to tell you, following Phil Black, you were coming on stage, <laughs> I'd never heard you speak before, I said, oh, this poor guy. Yeah. And you did awesome. You <laughs> were you. great, you held the audience, so congratulations, you were Thank very you, dynamic, yeah. and he was unbelievable, and you yeah. were fantastic, so. <laughs> well, it, t today was second worst speaking setup. One time I uh, was on a panel where it was uh, three admirals, a general, and then the other guy wearing a suit, I said, Oh, well, at least another schmo in a suit. And his opening lines were, you know, this reminds me when I was on the space shuttle and we were flying to the Hubble. <laughs> and I'm like, a flippin' astronaut? I got to follow an astronaut? So anyway, this, this was only a SEAL. There were a lot of them. There were far fewer astronauts. So that, that was easy. <laughs> what, I, what I really liked about your talk is, you, first of all, you told the story of Toyota, which I didn't know. You may have No, I, 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 my experience with Toyota was in the early 70s. I remember the... Toyota sort of sweeping into the market, but you talked about 20 years before when they were right. first entering and how this really was a company that had a lot of quality problems yeah. and was perceived as, as not being very competitive. Yeah, Toyota, Toyota now people look at as uh, almost, um, they just take for granted the quality of the productivity, they assume um, good labor relations and that kind of thing. You know, it's non-unionized, not because the unions haven't tried to unionize, but the uh, employees don't feel the need. And uh, yet in the 50s, Toyota was absolutely an abysmal automaker. Their, their product was terrible, their productivity was awful, and they didn't have particularly good relations with, the, um, with uh, the workforce either. I mean, it's a profound transformation. And you gave the stats, so in the 50s it was, I forget what it was, it was one-tenth the productivity yeah. of uh, the sort of average automobile manufacturer, and then they, they reached parity in 62, by 68 they were 2X, and by 73 they were off the charts. Right, right, right. Right, so amazing tra transformation. And then you tried to figure out how they did it, and they couldn't answer, but they said, we can show you. <laughs> yeah. Right? And that sort of led to your research and your book, right? Yeah, so the quick background is, um, in some regards, this fellow Kent Bowen, who was my mentor and advisor when I was doing my doctorate, we, you, you could argue we were late to the game, because uh, people started recognizing Toyota as this uh, um, paragon of uh, virtue, right? You know, high quality at low cost. And uh, so you, that, in the 1980s um, prompted this whole investigation and the term lean manufacturing came out of the realization that on any given day, Toyota and suppliers were making basically twice the product with half the effort. And uh, so you had this period of 85 to about 95 where there was this intense uh, attempt to um, study Toyota, document Toyota, imitate Toyota. General Motors had a joint venture with Toyota. And there you have the mid 90s and there's no second Toyota despite all this investment. So we go to the Toyota guys and say, um, Look, you know, clearly if everyone is uh, um, studying you, imitating you, copying you, and they haven't replicated you, they've missed something, so what is it? And they say, uh, I'm sorry, but we can't tell you. And we say, well, you got to be kidding. I mean, you have a joint venture with your biggest competitor, General Motors. And they said, no, no, it's not that we wouldn't tell you. We just actually don't know how to explain what we do because most of us learn it in this um, um, very immersive setting. But if you'd like to learn it, you can learn it the way we do. Um, I didn't realize at the time that it would be this karate kid, wax on, wax off, paint up, paint down experience, which <laughs> took you know, years and years um, to learn. And there's some funny anecdotes about it, but uh, even at the end, uh, you know, their inability to say what it is. So uh, I went years uh, trying to uh, capture what they were doing and realizing I was wrong because different things wouldn't work quite right. And I can tell you, I was on the Shinkansen in Japan with the guy who was my Toyota mentor, and I finally I said, Mr. Oba, I think I finally figured it out. It all boils down to these basic approaches to seeing and solving problems. And he's looking over my cartoons and stuff, and uh, he says, uh, well, I don't see anything wrong with this. <laughs> that, was, that was as good as it got. That was as good as it got. It was like, score, I call my wife. I said, yeah, <laughs> nothing wrong that he can see. <laughs> so, anyway. But so, you talk about productivity. Uh, re reliability, you For made sure. huge gains there, and, and the speed of product cycles, Yes, the sort of were the three knobs that Toyota was turning, you know, much more significantly yeah. than anybody else, and then fuel efficiency right. came in. 
Right, so if you start looking at Toyota, and I think this is where people first got the attraction and then sort of the dismissive of, we don't make cars. So um, the initial hook was the um, uh, affordable reliability, that they could deliver a much higher quality car, much more affordable based on their productivity. And so that's what triggered um, attention, which um, then manifests itself as this uh, lean manufacturing and its uh, production control tools. What, what then sort of started to fall off people's radar is that Toyota not only stayed ahead on those dimensions, but they added to the dimensionality of the game. So um, they started introducing new product faster than anybody else, and then they introduced new brand more successfully. So um, you know, all the Japanese, uh, Nissan, Honda, Toyota, all came out with a luxury version, but no one came out with Lexus other than Toyota, right? The, the, the Affinity and the Acura, I mean, it's nice cars, but it didn't become this dominant brand like the Lexus. And then uh, in trying to hit the youth market, you know, everyone tried to come up with like Honda had the element, but nothing like the Scion, right? So then Toyota's, you know, and that's much further upstream, much more big an undertaking than just productivity in a factory. And then when it came time to this um, issue around fuel efficiency, I mean, that's a big technology play of trying to figure out how you get these um, hybridized uh, um, technologies with a very, very complex software engineering overlay to coordinate power flow and this thing and that. And uh, everyone has their version of hybrid, but no one has it through six generations, 21 platforms, and, uh, and millions of copies sold, right? So th th it, it didn't matter where you were. Toyota figured out how to compete on this uh, value to market with speed and ease, which no one else in their industry was replicating. But you're talking about, uh, this is, has nothing to do with operational efficiency. When you talk about the Scion, for example, you're talking about tapping into a customer, into an emotional uh, connection yes. with your customer and being able to actually anticipate what they will want before right. they even know. Uh, how do you operationalize that? Yeah, so I, I think, again, Toyota made such a, an impression on people with operational efficiency that um, a lot of their genius uh, went um, unrecognized. So. You, what I was trying to elaborate on this morning is that Toyota's operational efficiency is not the consequence of just more clever design of operations. You know, like you have an algorithm which I lack and so you get to a better answer than, than I do. It was this um, very intense, um, almost empathetic approach to um, improving existing operations. You know, so um, you're working on something and it's difficult, so we're um, perceptive of that difficulty and try to understand the source of that difficulty and resolve it, and, and just do that relentlessly about everything all the time. And it's that empathy to understand your difficulty which then becomes the trigger for making things better. So as far as the scion comes in, what you see is the same notion of uh, empathic design applied to uh, the needs of the youth market. And the youth market, unlike the um, folks who were, let's say, at the time middle age, was less about reliable affordability, but these were people who were coming of age during the, the Benetton era, where, you know, very fast mass customization, or the iPod era, which was common chassis, but, uh, you know, very fast, inexpensive personalization. And uh, the folks at Toyota, um, said, you know what, the youth market, we don't really understand that. We had been really successful for this older mid-market, so let's try to understand the problems that the youth are trying to solve with their acquisitions, and it turned out personalization. And so if you look at the Scion, um, it wasn't necessarily a, a technically or technologically um, sophisticated, quote-unquote, sexy product. It, what it did was it lent itself towards um, very, um, diverse person, uh, personalization, which was the problem that the youth market was trying to solve. And you actually see, if I can go on, this, this notion of empathic design. So you see this with um, the Lexus. So, um, you know, I think the conventional wisdom about luxury cars was, um, you know, Uber technology and, you know, bling it, you know, throw chrome and leather and wood. Um, and uh, when Toyota tried that initially, they, they, they took what was, I guess now, um, the Avalon, a full-size car, and they blinged it up. And it was contradictory, because if you're looking for a luxury car, you don't go to a Toyota dealer. And if you go to a Toyota dealer and you see something with chrome and leather and wood veneer, you, you like you have dissonance. So they um, tried to understand what luxury meant from the American consumer perspective. And uh, again, it's, it wasn't, you, you always wish you get this job, but they sent an engineering team to live in Beverly Hills for some months. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, ooh, you know, ooh, twist my arm on that one, right? But uh, what they found was that luxury wasn't just the physical product, it was the, um, the respectful service around it 
You know, like when you came back to your hotel room, you walked in, people remembered your name or remembered that, uh, oh, you, we noticed that you used a lot of bath towels. We made sure there were extra in your room, that sort of thing. And um, if you look at the Lexus, and people were dismissive of the Lexus saying, well, you know, it looks like slightly fancier Toyota, but what, what's the big deal? It's not a Beamer or a Mercedes. But that wasn't the point. It was the um, experience you got when you went to, for sales and service, which was you got treated so nice, you know. And again, not like hoity-toity, but uh, just you got treated respectfully. So anyway, it all comes back to this empathic design around uh, what problem is the um, customer or someone inside a plant trying to solve. So, uh, you know, Toyota and Volkswagen trying to you know, vie for top market share, but Toyota, as you say, is has got this brand and this empathy that Volkswagen right. doesn't. You must get a lot of questions about Tesla. Um, right, right, right. Thoughts on Tesla? Yeah, um, cool product, cool technology, and you know, time will tell if they're actually solving a, a real problem. Uh, and, and I don't mean to be dismissive, it's just not an area where I've spent a lot of time. Yeah, hey, we don't really know. I yeah. mean, it's, it's amazing, and the software-defined yeah. automobile, and right. autonomous, who, who, very difficult to predict. Uh, yeah, we're very tight All on time. All the cool people but, seem to drive them though. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Yeah. Um, last question I have is, what, what the heck does this have to do with analytics at a conference like this? Well, oh. Right, so you start thinking about um, the, the Toyota model really is, uh, it's not that you can sit down and design something right, it's that you design things which you know, um, just deep rooted in your DNA, is that what you've designed is wrong. And that um, in order to get it right, and actually much righter than anything else in the marketplace, what you need to do is um, understand uh, what's wrong about it, and so the experience of the user will help inform what's wrong. You know, the workarounds they do, the inconveniences they experience, the um, the, the coping, the compensation they do, and that um, you can not only uh, use that to help inform what's wrong, but then help. Um, shape your understanding of how to get to right. And so where all this fits in is that when you start thinking about data, well first of all these are gigantic systems, right? Which um, is probably well informed to think in terms of these systems are being designed by flawed human beings, so the systems themselves have flaws, so it's good to be um, attentive to the flaws that are designed in so you can fix them and make them um, more usable by uh, your intended uh, clientele. But the other thing is that these systems can help you um, gain much greater uh, precision, granularity, frequency of um, sampling and understanding of where things are misfiring uh, sooner than later, smaller than larger, so you can adjust and adapt uh, and be more agile in um, shaping the experience. Well Steve, great work, thanks very much for coming to oh, theCUBE and sharing, and uh, great to meet you. Yeah, likewise, thanks for having me. You're welcome. All right, keep it right there everybody, Paul and I will be back with our next guest, we're live from Boston, this is theCUBE, right back. <laughs>